Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Stephen Hodgson, and I'm the head of publishing at AMEB. I'm very happy to be here today to launch the newly revised AMEB violin syllabus and series 10 publications, along with the principal consultant for the project, Philippa Page. During this online launch, Philippa and I will talk a little bit about the syllabus review, what has changed and what new publications are being released to support the new syllabus, the technical workbook, grade books, handbooks, recorded accompaniments and sight reading book. We will then have the privilege of hearing Monica Kuro and Stefan Kasamenos of the Chamber Ensemble Plexus perform some excerpts from the new AMEB series 10 grade books. Just before the performance though, I'll talk a little bit about a very exciting competition that is being launched by AMEB with our very generous competition partners, Glanville & Co and Daddario. So if you want to find out how to win a violin, you'll have to stay until at least then. Finally, if you have any questions throughout the course of the launch, please feel free to type them into the chat and we'll do our very best to answer them at the end if time permits. As many of you know, it has been 10 years since the AMEB violin syllabus was last revised. And the new syllabus is the result of a staggering amount of careful and thoughtful work from a number of contributors over the last two years. Philippa has led a team of violinists from around the country who together have reviewed every aspect of the syllabus, appraising and revising every manualist for every grade, revising and refining the technical work for each grade, putting together the sight reading parameters and reviewing the work of the sight reading composers. And finally, the enormous task of selecting and editing the works for the new grade books, Violin Series 10. I'd like to start by thanking each member of the Violin Syllabus and Publications team for the dedication, their expertise, and for the enormous amount of work done to bring the new Violin Syllabus and Publications to life. Thank you, Philippa Page, Principal Consultant, Julie Hewison, Level 1 Consultant, Karon Chan, Level 2 Consultant, and Fintan Murphy, Level 3 Consultant. Also to the sight reading composers, Nerida Oostenbrook and Loretta Finn, and Dr. Simon Perry, who has written the very detailed and illuminating Series 10 handbooks. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our principal consultant, Philippa Page. Although for many of you, Philippa will need no introduction. Philippa Page studied violin with Robert Pickler in Sydney before undertaking further study in London, where she worked for several years as a freelance violinist with a number of London orchestras and chamber ensembles, and also developed her teaching career. After a further two years as a member of the Bilbao Symphony Orchestra in Spain, she returned to Australia, where she joined the Sydney Symphony Orchestra, with whom she played for 30 years. Philippa was appointed to the Sydney Conservatorium part-time staff in 1985, and currently teaches at the Conservatorium High School, as well as maintaining a private studio. She presents masterclasses, lectures, and workshops, adjudicates I Steadfords and competitions, and has worked extensively as tutor and advisor to organizations such as the Sydney and the Australian Youth Orchestras. Philippa was the string advisor to AMEB New South Wales for many years, and was a syllabus writer for the two previous revisions of the violin syllabus. Welcome, Philippa. Thank you so much for being here and for your tireless work on this very exciting new release spanning now a number of years. Oh, thank you, Steve. Uh, it's, it's great to have an opportunity to talk about the syllabus and explain what we've been doing thank over you. the last two years. Uh, I'm sure it will be very interesting for everybody here. Um, we'd like to give everyone a, a bit of insight into the new violin syllabus and publications. Um, but there are so many aspects to a new syllabus like this, it's a bit hard to know where to start. So let's begin with the big picture. It's an AMEB syllabus with all of the usual components, technical work, repertoire, sight reading, general knowledge and oral tests. And like most of our syllabuses, this one goes all the way from preliminary, the very beginning of a violinist's journey, through to licentiate, a diploma style qualification aimed at really quite advanced players. Additionally, there are two kinds of exam that can be taken using this new syllabus. Our comprehensive exam, which will be very familiar to most, with technical work, repertoire, sight reading, oral test, and general knowledge components. And our repertoire exam, a style of exam that was rolled out in 2019 and has only repertoire requirements, although technical ability still forms a significant part of the examination criteria, of course. So what is it that has changed? Let's start with the technical work. 
Now the technical work is really the beating heart of the syllabus. And once it's been sketched out right at the beginning of the review process, it's used to inform the other aspects of the syllabus, repertoire selection, for instance, and the site reading. As part of the process, we held a number of focus groups with teachers and examiners to really get a feel for what the violin community would like to see in the new technical work. Philippa, can you give us a quick rundown of what has changed with the new violin technical work? Well, um, in line with the feedback we had from teachers over the last 10 years, and, and more particularly from the focus groups that we did early on in this process, we've aimed to streamline the new technical workbooks so there's a little bit less material to present at the actual exam without compromising the content, of course. Um, with the scales and arpeggios and you know, double stops and all of that part. Um, there's been a small amount of just adjustment of the keys, nothing major, and, and some reductions in the number of bowings that you know, bowing variants you might have to do for any particular scale. Occasionally, we've reduced the range of a double stop scale, or we might have, um, um, and we've sort of kept the range of it, it, it to sort of two or three um, keys per grade. Now, there are now there are only four exercises in each grade with a clear focus on the techniques relevant to the current and upcoming grade. In many cases, the length of the actual exercises have been cut down a little bit too, just to, to make it more concise. Uh, the aim is to consolidate the technique at a given level and also to introduce techniques that will appear at the next level so that they're up and running and ready for the repertoire in the next grade. Um, in the earlier grades, um, we're mainly looking at left hand and arm issues and shifting and position work and a progressive introduction of bowing skills and maybe some simple double stops or chords or something like that that's relevant to what they're playing in their pieces. In level two, we continue that development of shifting and tone production. And there's also further development of bowing skills along with a few techniques that will appear in the repertoire at these levels like harmonics, natural and artificial ornaments, pizzicato, um, just little little bits and pieces that might be useful. The new thing you'll notice in this new edition of the technical book is the occasional little gray box, which is marked extra, extra for experts. Now you haven't seen this before. And, and there might be something additional that's useful, but you don't have to do it for the exam. So it could be um, a useful scale or two, some ideas on developing vibrato, a little exercise on left-hand pizzicato, just things that might be um, handy that they might um, they might come up in one of the pieces or the playing in general um, they're entirely op op optional not for representation in the exam but they just might come in handy um, so that's in, in a nutshell that's what we've done <laughs> that's fantastic and I think we've got a couple of, of pages that have been up on uh, on the screen to show you what those look like in context so really little useful technical bits and bobs uh, not to be prepared for examination, but that might help with the repertoire, depending on what, what repertoire you're doing, um, or just help with the general development without putting any extra pressure on, on students uh, who are preparing for a particular exam. Um, so hitting the shelves very shortly is this brand new Amy B. Violin technical book. We're really proud with it, uh, really proud of it. Um, and like previous versions, this will take students all the way from preliminary through to grade eight. Uh, there's no separate, separate technical work for the certificate of performance, of course, or the associate or licentiate exams. Now, very closely related to the technical work is the sight reading component of a comprehensive AMEB exam. And there's a new sight reading book coming out with this release, which has been tailored to the benchmarks of the new syllabus. Essentially, this is a collection of graded sight reading examples aimed at providing students and teachers with some preparatory material but also to give a picture of the level of sight reading expected at examination. The sight reading exercises were written by two composers who are also violinists and educators, Loretta Finn and Nerida Ustenbrook. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how the sight reading was put together? Well, in constructing, I had to construct a sight reading brief for the composers. And I had a bit of, a, you know, had to think, you know, how am I going to encapsulate what, how do you describe what you want in sight reading? It's, so anyway, what I did, I, was, I went back to the technical book for in first instance, and then I had a look at the grade books in series nine and series 10. And I did a great big Excel spreadsheet with all the keys that appear in each grade, along with um, 
all the time signatures and what left hand issues turned up, you know, whether you've got this finger pattern or that finger pattern and so on. Bowings and articulations, uh, dynamics, tempi, rhythm patterns, range, everything I could think of that would describe what might be typical at that level. And that gave me a clear picture of what could reasonably be assumed to have become familiar to a candidate at the end of each level of study. And then I used that as a basis and we came up with a guide for the sight reading composers with parameters for each grade. And effectively what we asked for was a, a difficulty um, similar to the grade below the one in question and without too many and not too many different techniques in close proximity, especially in the earlier grades. So in other words, the sight reading for grade four would be closer to a grade three standard. And the aim is for the candidate to be able to focus on continuity and accuracy of playing without encountering a whole lot of unfamiliar techniques or too many hazards, you know, one on top of the other. Um, we, of course, we asked for a range of keys and a range of time signatures and a range of different tempi. So there's quite a cross section of what you might encounter at each level. And our composers sent a few initial exercises across the grades to be re reviewed and discussed. And then when we had all of the exercises that uh, Loretta and Nerida had written, they sent them to me for review again. I played through everything. Uh, and then I asked for some feedback from Julie in level one and from Caron in uh, level two. And we suggested a few more changes that just seemed to be appropriate. And there we have it. The sight reading book. Uh, look, thanks so much for that. I think uh, it, it's always, good to know a little bit about the process behind things, uh, behind publications like this and how much detail really goes in. Um, so that's the, the technical work and sight reading. But of course, what gets students really excited is the repertoire. Um, and in putting together the syllabus, a vast amount of time and thought goes into reviewing the existing manual lists, as well as finding and grading new repertoire. And there's a lot of it in this syllabus. Uh, what were the guiding principles behind repertoire selection? What did you want to achieve with the repertoire featured in the syllabus lists? Oh, well, I have to say this, this, this part of the review was probably my, almost my favourite. I, I love repertoire. Um, the first consideration is you've got to find pieces that are appealing to students and that will really motivate them to want to keep on moving with their study because they've got lots of other demands on their time. So it's, this, it's got to be engaging and, um, and fun. Um, the other crucial consideration, of course, is the pedagogical value of each piece. Is it, is it going to extend the student? Does it provide opportunities to use the and develop the technical points that we're uh, hammering away at in the technical book? And they, are they sort of developing their vital technical skills? And there's a feel thing about it too. Does it actually feel right at that level? And um, you also have to keep in mind that you've got a range of ages going, uh, of presenting for these exams in music. Uh, right across the level of candidates. You've got younger ones and you've got more mature players. So you've got to cater for the, you know, finding a program that will appeal to somebody who's you know, eight or nine, or it might be somebody who's 12 or 13 being the same uh, level. Um, we also need to look for a cross section of composers and styles and try to fill any gaps in the repertoire at each level that we might have discovered. And we, this time I think we particularly sought out more pieces by female composers because they're always underrepresented. Um, not so much this time though. And, and also Australian repertoire and more recent, and the more recent compositions from the uh, from the last few dec decades. I mean, we were sort of looking for anything that wasn't on the radar last time we did a review, and whatever's been written since, and seeing where it might fit. And I suppose for me, I think finally, it's always useful to keep in mind that the manual lists. It's actually a really useful resource for teachers uh, if you're looking to extend your teaching repertoire or find some material that's going to fill in the gap between one grade and the next. So there's that consideration as well, how to sequence it. So uh, an absolutely enormous task, um, vast amounts of repertoire to look over and appraise. How is it all done? Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> we've got a wonderful uh, team of consultants who undertook this work. And so everybody was beavering away on their own. Julie Hewison from Melbourne was responsible for level one. 
uh, Karen Chan from Sydney did level two and Fintan Murphy, Melbourne again, uh, did level three. And each, each of these people has a real wealth of experience in, in teaching and playing and, and the particular focus on the level that they were working with. Um, so they're really familiar with the repertoire and they're really, of course, really keen to find new and neglected repertoire to refresh the syllabus. And um, they were given access to various, they had a wonderful time, they were given access to sort of sheet music warehouses and libraries to, you know, anything that, uh, that would, would help to um, assist with this. And as we looked for sort of repertoire lists from other sort, we, we looked for repertoire lists of other sources like the uh, Canadian Examination System, American Street String Teachers Association, the British examinating, uh, examining systems and various European sources. So we, we, we were sort of looking at who, who uses what and where and, and where does it fit. Um, so each consultant in the end put the list together for their particular level. And my role as principal consultant was to just make sure that there's a seamless transition between the levels and a, a logical flow through the whole syllabus. Um, and uh, there weren't any gremlins where the same piece had turned up in two places, which just occasionally happened uh, <laughs> previously. <laughs> we established our technical benchmarks quite early in the process, and this gave a detailed rationale for repertoire selection and grading. Beyond that, it's a very experienced team of consultants, and I think we just all have a sense of what's going to be playable at any level. Um, and if in doubt, we, you know, we'd say, well, what do you think about this or what? So there's a lot of... Um, toing and throwing between us. Um, one thing is for sure, the process involved an enormous amount of work and a lot of playing through pieces and discussion and whatever, and uh, to find the right place for everything. And um, some amazing sessions where we ended up with music from one end of the house to the other. <laughs> <laughs> and it was each, each of the consultants uh, also contacted composers directly, uh, especially Australian composers, finding, finding new, new corners of the repertoire material that has been freshly composed just last year or even this year, um, which, is, which is incredibly exciting. Um, and this is true of, of every AMEB syllabus review. It's, it's a combination of setting those technical benchmarks right at the beginning, having a really solid rationale for selecting uh, works at each grade, and then combining that with the, the experience and uh, knowledge of, of our consultant team and dare, dare I say it, a small amount of in, intuition as well. Um, now, beyond the additions and the, and the um, small changes to the, the manual lists, have there been any big changes? Uh, obviously, you know, pieces are removed and new pieces added, but what about the overall list structure, how it's all put together? Oh, well, the list structures remain very similar um, in most cases. The, in level one, it hasn't changed uh, uh, really. Uh, list A, uh, list a is, is, has a technical focus. List B is slower works with an emphasis on tone and development. And list C is faster works with an emphasis on facility. And in level two, which is five to eight, um, it's, that's also remained similar. We have list A studies, list B Baroque and classical, this C is romantic and this is post-romantic with the, with the alternative styles, jazz and tango and ragtime and anything else we could find. Um, the certificate of performance, however, has changed. It's, it's gone from, it's now four lists rather than two. And it's got a very similar structure to the rest of level two. Um, it's, uh, list A is unaccompanied, but it does include studies, but not only. Um, list B is Baroque and classical. This C is romantic and this D is post-romantic and the um, alternative styles. The last revision of the syllabus was the first time we had this level in the syllabus and it's now, um, after 10 years, it's easier to see what would work best in terms of repertoire for this level and for list structure and we think this will work better. Um, but do keep in mind that it's basically a small recital rather than you just play four pieces, one from each list. You've got to have a little recital that lasts 25 to 35 minutes. So it's important to keep an eye on the timing. Some of the works are great, but they're quite short. So you might need more than four works to make up a program that fits the bill. And it's really important to make sure you do that. And this is, uh, this is true of uh, certificate AMUS and ALMUS. Absolutely, yeah. It's primarily really it's a, a time time consideration um, with, with some other <laughs> requirements as well. Yeah, yes, yeah, so you've got to make sure you've got the right pieces from the right list, but it also needs to be long enough and not too long. <laughs> um, 
So just don't forget to do that. Um, now the AMUS has four lists. It's uh, very much it's the same really as we had before. Four lists according to historical style. List A is Baroque, list B is classical and early romantic, list C is romantic and list D is post-romantic and alternative styles. And the Elmas, that's the, another change. It's still got four lists, but the uh, significant change for the new syllabus is that lists are, stru are structured according to genre. So list A is still a company, but list B is now sonatas. List C is concertos or pieces written originally with orchestra, and list D is concert and show pieces. So different periods of music could appear in any of the lists effectively. Um, and part of the requirement for Elmas now is that the candidates need to cover at least three different styles or historical periods. And one of those needs to be something post-romantic. Wonderful. So that's that's quite a change for Elmas uh, to it's separate the list by genre. Mm -hmm. um, and also a certificate, of course. And across the, the syllabus, a mix of old favourite pieces with some wonderful new additions uh, that I think will be really inspiring. Um, is there anything in particular that you're excited to about seeing on the manual lists for the very first time? Oh, well, uh, we've got a lot of new Australian repertoire, which is really exciting, um, uh, right through from preliminary too, which is marvellous. Um, it's, been, it's been quite a revelation to get to know all these new pieces and composers. Uh, I think, as you said earlier, Steve, um, the, the, um, the consultants have been busy um, contacting composers and writing to people and whatever and saying, well, what have you written and have you got this or what, you know, what's new and, and all sorts of things have come to light. So some of the Australian composers featured include um, Ross Edwards, who everyone is familiar with, and Elena Katz-Chernan, Stuart Greenbaum, quite a few pieces by Stuart, uh, Joe Chindamo, Loretta Finn, Lachlan Skipworth, Hugh Crosswaite, Nerida Oostenbrook, um, Emma Greenhill, Anne Carboyd, Stephen Chin, Margaret Brandon, Brendan Collins, and there are many others. And so beyond the Australian repertoire, the, um, the consultants have found you know, a really a wealth of recent repertoire that's kind of broadened the stylistic and technical development of the students. It's very important to play the more recent repertoire and, and figure out how you can adapt your technique to the, the slightly unusual demands that turn up in this sort of repertoire. Otherwise, you know, when you do get confronted with it and maybe in an orchestra, it's frightening. Um, so there's a lot to explore, especially in the more advanced grades and diplomas. Um, I'm really looking forward to trying out uh, some of the Hilary Hahn encores. She uh, commissioned 26 encores from 26 different composers. And then there's a, another piece that was written for a competition and they're in a, in a book called In 27 Pieces. Um, when we scattered these three from grade seven right up, with, up to Elmas, and there are lots of others, there's just a wealth of stuff to explore, and they're great pieces. Um, and there's also some new interesting names amongst the Baroque composers. Uh, Vinton in particular found some interesting stuff uh, in the um, diploma level. Um, it'd be particularly interesting for those who want to focus a bit on the early styles. Absolutely. And of course, there's always uh, a lot of research being done on uh, music. Well, all, all periods of music, but particularly uh, a, a focus on, on historically in, informed performance practice, which has given rise to a bunch of new editions of Baroque pieces, um, which is really great to see. So <clears throat> that's the manual lists. Um, and what we're really hoping uh, will excite everybody and uh, teachers and students alike uh, are the new grade books. Um, the new syllabus includes the previous series of grade books, that's series nine, uh, but also the brand new series, which is series 10. Uh, the grade books are, of course, an enormous part of a syllabus review. The content is painstakingly selected and lovingly edited by our team of consultants. Uh, and it's a process which takes many hundreds of hours. Uh, from a large team of contributors, including the consultants themselves, of course, the typesetters, editors, proofreaders, and proof players. So uh, tell us a little bit about how works were selected for the grade books uh, above and beyond the manual lists. What sort of things were you looking for in the pieces that went into these books um, above, above being just included on the manual lists? Oh, well, I think for the grade books, we're looking for the most appealing pieces from the manual list. 
uh, with a balance between new pieces that haven't appeared before and some old favourites that haven't, we haven't seen for a while. Um, we have to aim for a really good balance of techniques and keys and composers, styles, tempi, nationalities, and all of that goes into it. Um, so in the choice of studies, for instance, we particularly look for a range of different techniques so that we've got a good cross section of what's relevant to the grade and, and also what will lead on well to the next level. Um, in the other lists, we aim for a what would be a representative range of pieces for that particular uh, list, you know, how it's described. So for instance, at level two, we might, um, we might look for, a, uh, in a list B or something, we might look for two different Baroque composers, maybe two different nationalities, um, and then the uh, and classical composers in this, you know, so a mix of sonatas and concertos perhaps. Um, and in list D, C, we would look for a mix of faster and more virtuosic pieces and some slower and expressive ones. And in list D, maybe a mix of early 20th century, something that's more recent, you know, right, you know, so hot off the press, and some alternative styles. And the aim is just to, to cater to all tastes and provide a really useful resource for the teacher so that you've got, you've got as, as much as we can, um, not, perhaps not one of everything, but as close as we can get to that. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, of course, it's it's the most appealing and, and favourite pieces and the pieces that appeal to us, but also what, what we think that the teachers and students out there will, will really enjoy. But then there's that matter of trying to balance things and making sure that not every piece is in G major or not every piece focuses <laughs> on one particular technique. It's a real, real balancing act. Um, now, to support series 10, uh, we also have a set of handbooks and these are written by Dr. Simon Perry and give really detailed analyses of every work in the grade books, as well as biographical details of the composers, details on style and the, the historical period. Um, these will be available both in hard copy. There's a level one book for preliminary three to grade four and a level two book for grades five through to grade seven. Um, and they also will be in, available as downloads in individual grades. So you'll just be able to, to buy the one, one grade and this will be particularly useful for students, of course. Um, these are extremely illuminating and really get to the heart of what makes each piece tick. So if you're ever playing through a piece with a student and wondering what is that B flat doing there, the handbooks will be the place to go to find out exactly what's going on uh, behind the music. Additionally, there'll be a set of recorded accompaniments for series 10, preliminary through to grade three. These recorded accompaniments can be used both for practice and in examination. Um, beyond grade three, of course, an accompanist is required for AMEB examinations. So AMEB does not produce recorded accompaniments beyond that level. So now we'd like to give everybody a bit of a sneak peek of the contents of this new series. And we've, uh, so we're, we're very lucky to have a performance by Monica Kuro and Stefan Kasamenos of the Chamber Ensemble Plexus to perform some of the works in the books. Um, Philippa will introduce each work and tell you a little bit about why it was selected. Um, while we're setting these performances up, however, I'd like to tell you a little bit about a very exciting competition that is just being launched by AMEB with our very generous competition partners, Glanville & Co and Daddario. You or your students could win a new Glanville Daintree D20 violin valued at $2,700, Daddario Kaplan strings and an AMEB Violin Series 10 book pack by answering the following. What's your favorite piece from the AMEB Violin Series 10 grade books? And how would a new Glanville & Co Daintree D20 violin help you play it at your best? You can answer in one of the following formats, written, in 100 words or less, with an image, or in a 30 second video. Be as creative as you like. There are also three runner up prizes, which include a set of Daddario Kaplan strings and an AMEB book pack. There's a link on the screen that will lead you to more information. And this link will also be emailed to you at the conclusion of this launch event. The competition runs from December 15th until March the 31st, so grab your grade books as soon as possible and start exploring. Okay, well, the first one is a little piece in preliminary uh, in list B. Uh, it's by Emma Greenhill and it's called Desert Rain. 
It's a really pretty little piece. It's nice and atmospheric. It's got an attractive second violin part just for practice purposes, which is handy. Um, it's great for developing the use of the whole bow length and for just basic bow to bit distribution. And next we have a grade two piece from list C. This one's called Trick or Treat and it's by Nerida Oostenbroek. Um, but this is actually marked spooky. Uh, you'll see why. It's good fun and it incorporates a lot of useful technical points that appear at this level, augmented seconds, hook stroke, harmonics, and a little bit of left hand pizzicato. <laughs> something from grade four in list C. Uh, it's a piece called In a Spanish Garden by Josephine Trott. People might remember that name. She wrote some great books for double stopping as well that are very attractive. So this is a lovely little piece. Um, it's got a nice contrast between the lively opening section with its harmonics and semiquavers and the legato middle section which has got lovely opportunities for showing off the newly developed vibrato at this level. <laughs> Thank you. 
next there's a piece by Carlo Tessarini. I hadn't heard of this one before. It's, uh, it's an allegro from a concerto that he wrote. Um, it's a new one. I've, I've never, I hadn't come across it before. Very attractive little concerto with all the typical stylistic points that you'd expect in a, in a, in a Baroque concerto. Great piece. Lastly, um, a grade seven piece uh, by Margaret Brandman uh, called Jucara Rumba d'Amor. Um, this is a Latin American flavored piece and it offers plenty of room for imagination. And it's a really good one for work working on a, a lovely warm tone with expressive shifts. <laughs> Thank you so much, Monica Kuro and Stefan Kasomenos of the Chamber Ensemble Plexus, um, and also to Philippa for introducing those pieces so beautifully. And what a privilege it is to hear them uh, performed at such a high level, especially for those of us who have been working on the notes on the page for such a long time. It's, <laughs> it's always wonderful to hear them finally come to life. Um, I should mention that a number of those were just excerpts. They weren't the, the entire piece. If you thought that they were they had abrupt endings that was just because they were just excerpts of the pieces uh, to give you a little bit of a uh, sneak peek. Um, before we go, there have been a few questions. Well, just a couple of questions that have been sent through via the chat function. So I'll try to answer those now. Uh, at, so how, how long uh, will series nine be in use for and when, uh, when will it be completely phased out? I can certainly answer that. So series nine features on the new syllabus. So at the moment, there's no plans to phase it out. It will last at least for the life of this new syllabus. We imagine at least 10 years or so, probably a very similar life span to the, to the previous syllabus. So definitely series nine will be in use for a little while longer. Um, we had uh, a question about what level is the concerto in? Uh, so that was the, the Tessarini concerto that was in grade five 
uh, list B, that's, that's your list B option in the grade five book in series 10. Um, we've got a question, at what grade level would you expect to see vibrato? Philippa, do you want to? Well, I think one? <laughs> yeah. um, the syllabus is, states that, that, that we'd like to see vibrato by grade four. So I, I mean, ideally, um, probably start working on it a little earlier than that. Um, if you know, if everything else in the left hand setup is is looking fairly secure, um, it's possible to get it started earlier. I think, but certainly by grade four, you'd you would expect to see it. Yes, uh, and I I believe it's it's just evidence of a developing vibrato by by grade yeah. four. I'll have to yeah. look. I'll have to look up the syllabus objectives uh, yeah. to, to answer that more securely. But um, obviously, you, everybody's vibrato develops at different rates, uh, and and students are free to start using it when it starts happening. But definitely by level two, we're looking at at having a good good sense of developing vibrato. Um, so we have a question. Uh, can the series nine technical workbook still be used for exam? This is a, a really great question. Uh, the, the different syllabuses are tied to their particular uh, technical work. So the previous technical work can only be used if you're using the previous syllabus and the new technical work can only be used if you're using the new syllabus. There is a transition of two years. So you have this year and next um, in which both syllabuses will be examined and you'll have to specify whether you're using the old or the new syllabus in examination, but you can't use a combination of the two syllabuses. It has to be either the new, which has the new technical work or the old, which has the old technical, uh, technical work. So there's a two year transition starting 2022. Uh, so 2024 is when the uh, old syllabus will be withdrawn and along with that is the old syllabus technical work but the very important point is you can't combine the two you can't use the old syllabus with the new technical work or vice versa uh, are we thinking of doing a series two for viola that's a very good question as well yes we absolutely are and and work is starting on that uh very shortly um viola will be revised over the next year or possibly longer depending on how, how long it takes. Um, but viola is definitely the next uh, syllabus being reviewed. Um, bear with me one moment. Uh, so there's a question about more recorded accompaniments than grade three during our, especially during lockdown. This this is a an interesting question. Um, we, we do understand that, um, but for, for, for the AMEB's uses at the moment, uh, lockdown aside, uh, a, a live accompanist is required for, for examinations from grade four onwards. And so to, to have official AMEB recorded accompaniments beyond that level um, may be a little confusing. Um, and so, so we, are, we really do encourage uh, students and, and teachers to use uh, a, a live accompanist beyond that. Obviously, lockdown is a little bit different and there are different arrangements put in place uh, currently for, for lockdown. Um, but uh, the recorded accompaniments will remain uh, going up to grade three only. So, sorry, just one moment. I'm, just looking through the lots of questions coming through now. Uh, will the current technical workbook still be able to be used in conjunction with the new repertoire? Uh, no, that's that that was that point I was uh, making before. It, it it's either the old syllabus and the old technical work, or the new syllabus with the new technical work. No mixing and matching. Um, however, because series nine, which is the the last gradebook series, is on the new syllabus, you can use pieces from series nine with the new technical work if you're uh, submitting for examination using the new syllabus, not the old syllabus. Will series eight be able to be used for the next two years during the transition phase? Yes. Uh, so as again, as long as you're using the old syllabus and you make that clear in your um, application to your state office, 
that you're using the old syllabus, series eight will be able to be used for the transition period. Uh, I think that's about all that we have and probably all that we have time for. Um, will the same resourcing that went on for the violin syllabus be there for the review of the, the viola syllabus? We haven't quite got a picture of um, exactly how, how big the viola syllabus review will be. Um, our intention is certainly to produce grade books uh, and, and technical work a technical workbook and, and sight reading book. Beyond that, we're not quite sure at this stage um, and we'll, we'll let that be known as soon as we, we have a good idea of exactly what that review will entail. Um, but I think that's all that we've got time for right now. Um, thank you so much for your questions. And that concludes our Amy B Violin Syllabus and Publications launch. So the new syllabus is available tomorrow. This is online and via your local music retailers. Um, and the new Violin Series 10 publications can be pre-ordered now. These are available from the 15th of December at your local music shop via amyb.edu.au and via other online sheet music retailers. So thank you once again to Philippa Page, uh, the principal consultant for the Violin Syllabus Project and the other consultants and contributors to the syllabus and books. The consultant team, of course, Julie Hewison, Karen Chan and Fintan Murphy, sight reading composers, Loretta Finn and Nerida Oostenbroek, hand, handbook writer, Dr. Simon Perry, as well as our typesetting and proofreading team and the many Australian and international composers whose works make the grade books and the manual lists so very interesting and so very good. Um, thank you also to the behind the scenes team at AMEB, especially Bernard De, De Pasquale, AMEB CEO, and Alana Coldwell for making this online launch possible, and to Monica Kuro and Stefan Casamenos for their inspiring performances of those excerpts from the grade books. Um, and at last, uh, and certainly not least, to everyone who has attended this launch uh, now and who, who, who is watching later on when it will become uh, available via YouTube. We'll send out links to that. Um, thank you so much for attending. We hope the new violin syllabus and publications serve the violin community as a useful and inspiring resource for years to come. Thank you very much and goodbye.